Christ. The, objection, the objective of our exhortation this morning is to try to endeavour to draw together a number of the thoughts from the ministry of Malachi, which, uh, as you're all well aware, has been the subject of four very recent Bible studies. So I want to try and draw the book to a conclusion, as the book itself does in a very, very wonderful exhortational manner, and a very exhortational note, a note of encouragement, a note of comfort, a note of strengthening for those who remain faithful to the things of Almighty God. Despite the environment and all its evil and all its ungodliness which surrounds them, and will continue to do so until the coming of the Lord. So, Malachi, in our last study, we saw really the wonder of chapter 3 and verse 16, where we read, Then they that feared Yahweh spake often one to another, and Yahweh hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahweh and that thought upon his name. Now isn't that just an absolutely wonderful verse of scripture? There's a faithful remnant there. As there has been in every age, then they that feared Yahweh spake often one to another. Now when you look carefully at chapter 3 and verse 16, you notice that that verse actually sets out for us or sets forth the basic characteristics of a true priest. No, Malachi has been devoted to the condemnation throughout his book to the condemnation of the priesthood because they didn't fear Yahweh and they did not hearken unto him. But there was this faithful remnant amongst the people and what a staggering contrast verse 16 provides to those expressed, to his thoughts expressed in chapter 3 at verses 13, verse 14 and verse 15. So within the ecclesia in Malachi's time, and we have to remember this book is so relevant to our day, in the ecclesia at Malachi's time there were two distinct groups of people. There were those that feared Yahweh and spake often one to another about the things of the truth. And there were those who thought in a very opposite manner. They thought that their religion was a, a casual matter but they could do really what they liked with God's word. And whatever you did, that God would be pleased with what you did and God would be very gratified at anything that you did in the way of divine worship. But these brethren of verse 16, they were those that worshipped God in spirit and who rejoiced in the truth. They were the ones who actually fulfilled the words that Paul has in Philippians chapter 3. If you just... I'll keep your finger in Malachi. Just have a quick look at Philippians chapter 3. So these are the ones that fulfilled these words here in Philippians chapter 3 at verse 3. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So he speaks of those who rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. And you see, that's the very, very key element of verse 16. There's no mention there whatsoever of the flesh. There's no mention there whatsoever of serving self. There's no mention of the glorif glorification of human nature or flesh. They that feared Yahweh spake often one to another upon the things of Yahweh. That's what was dominating their thinking. And, and as I said, they're glorious words. They represent to us a single-minded, wholehearted dedication to the things of the truth and a spirit of utter humility before Almighty God. And together with that, there is represented in that verse a complete repudiation of the flesh and the thinking of the flesh and the goals and ambitions and the hopes of the flesh. So we have in verse 16 the attitude of mind 
and dedication the only thing that will bring us joyfully into the kingdom of God. So these brethren, we read, they feared Yahweh and therefore they spake often one to another. And they spake often to one to another because the things of the truth, the things that God taught them, those were the things in which they delighted. The things of God were the things that actually fired them up, that gave them a zeal, that encouraged them for the future. They conversed one with another. As Rosalind renders it, they talked one to another. Oh, they conversed, as uh, Rosalind renders it, and Moffat says they talked one to another. And it would seem from the text of Malachi here that at that time that Malachi rose up to prophesy, as we saw from the first study, that he was but a revelation of God's word to that ecclesia. So it seems at the time that he rose up to reveal God's word to that ecclesia, that the faithful remnant had become more and more isolated from the great majority that really didn't want anything to do with people who feared Yahweh and who spoke to one another about the things concerning God. Because after all, the majority, their words, Yahweh says, against him were very stout. In verse 13 it says they used his words against him were very stout. Now that word in, in chapter 3 verse 13 means strong or harsh. Their words against Yahweh were extremely strong and extremely harsh. In verse 14, 14 says, if they were saying it was vain to serve God by their way of life, was showing it was just vain to serve God. Verse 15, they were saying there was no profit in serving God and they were calling the proud happy. It's as if they thought that those who were wicked, those who were set up, those who were established and successful, and those that in spite that kicked the dog, they were the ones who were delivered. So what did they have in common with those who had an attitude wherein they feared Yahweh? And in humble submission they bowed before Yahweh and they spake often one to another of those things. So there we actually, brothers and sisters, learn the lesson that this faithful remnant of Malachi 3.16 could only endeavour under those circumstances to maintain their own integrity before God, to try and manifest lives of holiness and devotion to his service with wholehearted dedication to give their lives unto him and to support one another and to strengthen one another and to comfort one another, getting encouragement wherever it was possible to do so, as they spoke often one to another. And there's great exhortation for us there, brothers and sisters, because I think we fail greatly to talk to one another enough about the things of the truth. We fail in a great way. Yes, we get stuff from the platform. We get exhorts and we get lectures and we get Bible studies, but do we actually talk to one another about the things of the truth, as we should? Well, they spake one to another. Older ones, older sisters to the younger sisters, the, the older brothers to the younger brothers, to pass on experience, to pass on care, to talk with the young and see how things were going for them. You know, regardless of our age or our circumstances, we're all brethren together. There aren't, shouldn't be different groups and different cliques in Ecclesia. We're all brethren together. We all stand equal at the judgment seat at Christ's return. Each and every one of us stand equal. There should be absolutely no divisions in our Ecclesia by gender, by age, by attitude, and absolutely, brethren, not on doctrine. Absolutely. You know, it's very difficult to maintain a very sound, clear state of integrity before God when the overall atmosphere and environment is one of faithful, faithlessness and ungodliness. We've all experienced that from the world around us. It's not easy. And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ warned us of the similar circumstances that, was, that would develop towards the time of the end. So come with me over to Matthew 24. It's a quick look at Matthew, a few verses in Matthew 24. This is what the Lord warned us of to expect in the last days. Matthew 24. Let's start at, uh, we'll start at verse 3, shall we? 
Now, we have the Lord, the scene is the Lord, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. And the disciples are coming up to him privately. It means individually, one at a time, and they're asking the Lord questions. They're talking to him about the truth and what's it mean. And they, and he, he, they say to him, tell us, verse 3, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumours of war. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, have we seen all those things? Have we seen wars in recent years over the last few generations? Have we seen wars, rumours of wars? Have we seen nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom? Have we seen famines in various places, pestilences, earthquakes? Well, here in Christchurch, we certainly have. That all these are the beginning of sorrows, he says. In verse 9, he continues and says, Then shall they deliver you up to the afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Christ gives us very very clear warning when he said because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold you know what that's the result of that's the result of pressure the pressure that is coming upon the body of Christ and upon the body of the believers of any generation not just Malachi's time but today here especially for us and when that pressure is exerted upon us upon the body of believers it causes them to weaken their faith. And that's what's happened to us. The truth should separate us from the world. The world doesn't want to know about us, a class of people who are depicted in Malachi 3.16. The world doesn't want to know a class of people like that. Those brethren spoke often one to another for a number of reasons, because they delighted in the things of the truth. They were drawn together by a mutual understanding of God's word. They conversed together to encourage one another at a time when the love of many had waxed cold, and when these true sons of God were under tremendous pressure from within the ecclesia itself. You know, we find the example of David here as well. And you might uh, know the verse in Psalm 34 of verse 11 when, when David said that he had have, he'd suffered great hardship and great persecution and he gathered together around him in his isolation um, having been separated from his loved ones by the effect that Saul's persecution had upon him and he gathers a little group around him and he utters to that little group some of the really probably some of the most wonderful words in the whole of scripture and he says to that those that group around him his mighty men he says to them come my children hearken unto me and i will teach you the fear of yahweh and he did you know out of that policy and by that means he formed the nucleus of what eventually became a converted nation he formed the nucleus there in the cave of adullam among a group of men whom he fired with a zeal for the truth and with a knowledge and an understanding of the truth and of those things. And of what it means to fear Yahweh and to speak often one to another. So he fired up that nation in that way and they headed off in that direction under David's direction from that point onwards. Just imagine Christ returns. What a wonderful thing. It would really be to meet these brethren of the days of Malachi, of whom he writes. Imagine the time when they're going to be gathered before the judgment seat of Christ. And Christ, we know, is going to commend those brethren because he told them, your name is already written in my book of remembrance. So he's going to commend them. that, de For despite the pressures of life, despite the peer group pressures that have mounted upon them, 
Despite the false leadership within their community at that time, they have clung tenaciously to that which is right. They have feared Yahweh and they have spoken often one to another. And Yahweh had hearkened to them and he had heard it and it's on the record in the mind of the Father. It's written in the book of remembrance. You know, we, we can read through the book of Nehemiah. We can read back through Malachi again. We can go a little further back and read the book of Ezra. And then we'll get some idea of the things that those brethren had to suffer and the things that they went through. Things that had the effect of building up their faith and causing them to be prepared and ready for the kingdom of God. You know, what a wonderful thing it is that God remembers all those things. He tells us that. And to those words, Yahweh hearkened. You know, there's a reminder that all those things are always remembered. They'll never be forgotten. And the faithfulness of his true sons and daughters will be that which will provide their passport into the kingdom of God. And in verse 17 of chapter 3, God says to them, God says, they shall be mine. Now, aren't they fantastic words? God says of this group of people, they shall be mine. They are words of possessiveness. They're the words of a possessive God. They shall be mine. It's an astonishing statement when we really consider what it means. In the midst of a world which we know is dominated by sin and evil, lawlessness, spiritual and moral perversion, every form of violence and iniquity and every form of God-dishonouring spirit that the human heart can devise and with which man has now managed to completely fill this, the earth within this age in which we live. In the midst of all that, there is a class of people, not necessarily large at any time in history, nor large in any influence or in any power, but Yahweh delights to call them his very own. And these are the ones who truly thought about, those who truly think upon the name of Yahweh, and how wonderful it is that he acknowledges them in that way. How wonderful it is to think to be, to be owned by Yahweh, to be acknowledged by him and to be vindicated by him. They shall be mine, says Yahweh Sabaoth. One of 20 times that name occurs with that title in the book of Malachi. So we're reminded there of the words of the prophet Zechariah in chapter 4, verse 6, when he says, Not by might, nor by power, but my spirit, saith Yahweh Sabaoth, he who will be armies. God will manifest himself in a militant manifestation in defence of his faithful ones of Malachi 3, verse 16. And those of every generation down through history who are like-minded to those same people, he says, they shall be mine in that day when I make up my jewels. Now the Jerusalem Bible, as we've already seen from our study, renders that my own special possession. And you know, the idea of that, that their possession, that the idea of that word is taken from the concept of private property. The jewels in the characters, the gold, the silver and the precious stones in the characters of the faithful men and women down through the ages that have feared Yahweh and spoken often one to another. The jewels of those characters are the personal, private possession of Almighty God because they are for his name and for his glory and for his purpose and not for any other. And you know another very beautiful thing about that word? It's in the feminine tense. In the Hebrew language, it's in the feminine tense, and it's passive. It's feminine passive, and therefore it's a wonderful word to symbolise the bride of Christ who passively surrenders up her will to the will of his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So God says he will spare them. He will spare them who have this attitude and this disposition. Now Rotherham renders in that verse... It very beautifully, and I believe probably the most literally, when he renders it, I will deal tenderly with them. It's a word that means to be mild or gentle. And what a wonderful thing to look forward to, that we will come to a time, brothers and sisters, when our God 
is going to deal very, very tenderly with us. As a father with a child that he loves so much, as he says, I will spare them, verse 17, chapter 3, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. And that phrase, so near to the climax of the book, takes us really right back to the beginning of Yahweh's controversy in this book with his people. Chapter 1 at verse 6, he says there, which we virtually started our studies there, he says in that chapter we read, A son honoureth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honour? And if I be a master, where is my fear? So back there in chapter 1 at verse 6, Yahweh is telling us that it will only be a faithful remnant. Some will come under that category. There will be some he will gladly receive in that spirit who will receive the love of God. And that's a wonderful thing to think about, isn't it? As a man spareth his own son, but not any son, he says, the son that serveth him, the son that loves his father, a son who shows affection for his father, a son who respects his father, a son who walks obediently to, obediently to the upbringing and the instruction and the discipline of his father. That's the kind of son or the kind of daughter that's going to be part of those precious jewels that God is going to reveal for all the world to see. So the glorious privileges that are enjoyed by those who are truly in the faith have been outlined for us in those verses. We have seen that these people have the ear of God, that they are recorded forever in the mind of God. They have fellowship with God. They will be vindicated by God and they'll be elevated to glory by God. What a privileged, privileged people are the true saints of Almighty God. So upon that note then, Malachi actually turns back to the nation in verse 18. He says, Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. And that was something that they were utterly unable to do in the days of Malachi because they wouldn't listen. They would not receive his words. Malachi says to them, The time is coming when you will learn to discern. Now, we saw in the last study that that word discern is a word which means to see the difference. And as already stated one of the, in the last study, one of the greatest problems in ecclesial life today, in central fellowship today, one of the greatest problems is the ability to discern. You know, the simplest explanation of the word discern is be, it would be being able to distinguish between right and wrong. Down through the ages, false teachers and underminers of the faith have been responsible for encouraging apostasy and the process of gradually declining or deteriorating the truth. But without a doubt, one of the greatest factors which has resulted in defection from the truth of abandonment of sound doctrine and practice has been the inability of the flock at large to discern the truth to see the difference, when they have to make a decision between truth and error and thereupon to act uncompromisingly in defence of the truth. It's becoming harder and harder and harder to do that as the pressures of life bear in upon us. But you know, God said that would be the case. Now the ecclesia in the days of Malachi were unable to discern. Eight times... Eight times they challenged Yahweh, and eight times he gives back a direct, a direct answer. And yet they still failed to discern. And why did Malachi record eight challenges from this ecclesia? Well, eight is the biblical number associated with the cutting off of the flesh, Genesis 17, verse 12. So the time is very shortly to come when they will finally accept the answers to their questions, the challenges they made to Yahweh and Malachi, And they will then learn to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. There's eight times they challenged them, eight answers he gave them. So they will learn to discern. Yes, God does love them. That's verse, chapter 1, verse 2. They will learn that Yahweh must be honoured as their father and reverenced as their master. Chapter 1, verse 6. Neither God nor his altar are to be polluted, as is the case when his people are morally 
morally and spiritually defiled, chapter 1, verse 7. They will understand they must keep covenant with Yahweh and man, having a special respect for God and for family, chapter 2, verse 10. Claims to be sons and servants of God must be matched by performance, chapter 2, verse 17. It's absolutely necessary to remain faithful, faithful to the commandments, to the ordinance of Yahweh, chapter 3, verse 7. God must not be robbed of things which rightly belong to him. And his claims upon us, upon man, must not be ignored. Chapter 3, verse 8. Words uttered and propounded by God's servants must always express truth and never be directed against Yahweh and his brethren. Chapter 3, verse 13. So there's the eight answers he gave to them. And yes, the day is coming when they will learn to discern those things. So as true sons and servants, Ecclesia will finally learn to serve Yahweh in spirit and in truth. But now we very beautifully come to a very beautiful section of Malachi in chapter 4. Chapter 4 is open to us. And we read in verse 1 of chapter 4, For behold, the day cometh. Now we need to understand that the background of chapter 4 is those closing words of chapter 3, verse 18. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. And that day, when Israel is rejuvenated, that will be the epoch of the coming of Messiah, who will bring about that rejuvenation, who will bring, bring about the ability that is planted in them to discern things that they could not discern in the days of Malachi. So we read there in verse 1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn like an oven, and the proud and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. Now you notice immediately the reference, the reference back there to chapter 3, verse 15, where it said, Will they call the proud happy in that day? Will the wicked be set up in that day? Well, here we have the answer. Verse 1 of chapter 4, No, the proud shall burn as in an oven, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, say Yahweh Sabaoth, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But then we come to verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. So in verse 2, we have a reference back to chapter 3, verse 16. Ye that fear my name. They and all others from every age who have imitated his characteristics. So from the figure we had in verse 1 of a fiery furnace burning with incalculable heat and ferocity and destruction, an allegory is now presented to us of the sun rising into the heavens to dispel the darkness and the gloom of night. Now we know the son of righteousness is a metaphor for our Lord Jesus Christ. So this verse is very graphically and very beautifully foretelling the time when the Lord Jesus Christ, who with his bride, the moon and the stars, will lighten gloriously the new heaven and the new earth of Yahweh's kingdom, as depicted in the prophecy of Isaiah and elsewhere. And they will dispel the darkness and the gloom of a long and tragic Gentile night and the long and tragic Jewish history of the nation of Israel and they will bring sanity and justice, righteousness and mercy to a world that is in need. You know, today we live in a world of darkness from which we must remain uncontaminated if we wish to be numbered among those that feared Yahweh and spake often one to another. You know, those who will be with the, with the son of righteousness when he arises with healing in his wings. Now the idea of the translation of the word wings here is that it, it really is a word that relates to or means to an edge or an extremity. So the picture that's really presented here for us is that of the sun arising above the horizon at the dawn of a new day. There's the first glimmer of the sight of the sun and the rays going forth into the heavens. And the rays, we believe, are, are typical of the saints that shall go forth in a great multitude from the Son of Righteousness to enlighten the earth and to flood it with light and to bring justice and righteousness and mercy. 
The saints will become the rays or the beams which, which, beams which will extend from the sun and flood the earth. And you find, in fact, that's, and we haven't got time to look at it, but specifically illustrated for us in Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 4, particularly when you read the RSV that says, His brightness was like the light, and rays flashed from his hand. And what a wonderful time depicted for us in, in 2 Thessalonians. If, if just pop over to 2 Thessalonians for a moment. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. Verse 7, for connection. Verse 7 of uh, Second of Thessalonians, chapter 1. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, doesn't that make it all worthwhile all the trial the tribulation everything we've been through is doesn't that make it worthwhile maintaining our integrity before our god in spite of all the circumstances of life to remain faithful to the purity of the truth to uphold that which we know to be right and to stand for those things no matter what pressures may be brought against us from within or from without. If we have that vision firmly in our minds, then we will go on with it and we'll go forward to the ultimate glory that shall be re revealed in us, the glory of Almighty God. So then he says in verse 2 of chapter 4, And ye shall go forth. So the multitudinous Christ body will become the vehicle in which the divine power and the divine judgments will go forth to the nations. And he says... And ye shall grow up as calves of the stall. You know, that would be much better translated as the Jerusalem Bible does. And ye shall leap like calves going out to pasture. So when spring comes, the sun comes. And you, see, you finally see, after a long winter, the sun shining in the sky. So the analogy here is very beautiful and it's all linked together. You imagine those calves that have been held within a, a dark, dank barn through the deep winter months. Then suddenly the doors are flung open, the sun shining, and then they come leaping out, like calves leaping out to the pasture. It's, it's just a wonderful simile, really, for the joy that will be known by all of the redeemed when Christ has granted them divine nature and then sent them forth in the glory of the Father to subdue the nations. And in verse 3 we have this, I believe, a beautiful allusion to the doctrine of God manifestation. In verse 3 it says, Ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith Yahweh Sabaoth. So the one I would be manifested in the many ye. Then we have a final word here in chapter 4 for Israel. He says to them, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. So this final section here of Malachi's book gives us a very last very clear reminder of the obligations which were incumbent upon those in covenant relationship with Israel's God. Malachi is virtually reminding the ecclesia of the principle evoked by Isaiah in Isaiah 30 verse 21. Here is the way, walk ye in it. 
Attention was being drawn directly here to Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, in which the terms of the covenant made between Yahweh and his people, which provided blessings from God in return for faithfulness from his ecclesia. So thus fittingly here, the last Old Testament writer endorses the first, Moses. Then in verse 5, Elijah, we're told, is to go forth to the nations, to the ten tribes, to those for whom he was previously appointed. So he will take up the work where he left it off. And the ten tribes, prophetically speaking, are those Israelites that are scattered throughout the Gentile world to this day. Zechariah tells us that Christ will save the tents of Judah first, that is the Jews dwelling in the land. But Elijah's work together with many other of the ancient prophets, resurrected and mortalised, will go forth under his leadership and they will go forth to bring those Jews back to the land. Micah tells us the story of how they will fight their way back to the land if they have faith and if they believe in the things of God. And there, there will be the beginning of the renewal of faith within the people of Israel. A faith which we ourselves in our day, in our generation, brothers and sisters, have got to develop to the point where God is actually satisfied with us. We are being tried. The refiner works at his pot. We are under fire. We are in the fire. He is refining us and he is removing the dross. We have to get ourselves to the point where God is satisfied with us. So in this way, he says in verse 6, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. Now, you'll note immediately the analogy back there to chapter 1 and verse 6, the relationship between a father and a son. So God's final word in this book, his final words is, Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now when we look at these final words, that of course is the curse promised in the law. And we contrast those closing words with the opening words of the book in chapter 1 verse 2. Yahweh said to his ecclesia, I have loved you. And there we began the studies. But the ecclesia rejected the divine love and have since paid a tremendous price for that rejection and the error of their ways. They rejected the divine love because of three principles that we've seen through our studies, three weaknesses that they've demonstrated. Their ignorance of God's word, their indifference to God's word, and their own self-seeking after the things, their own things to the exclusion of serving God. Our objective, brothers and sisters, is to be diligent, and see that we do not follow after the same manner of unbelief as these people of Malachi's day. As Paul demonstrates for us, just come over with me, last quote we'll look at, Hebrews chapter 3. Now in Hebrews 3, Verse 12, we read, Take heed, brethren, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So we are to see that we are numbered among those who fear Yahweh and that think upon his name and we will be the ones, as the theme of our studies on Malachi were, we will be the ones who will abide the day of his coming and we shall stand when he appeareth. Or as Rotherham's has rendered it, who's going to survive that time and who will be justified by him? So we answer the question, who may abide the day of his coming? Well, that answer is quite simple. Those who have the spirit of Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16. Those who are described again in chapter 3 and verse 17 of Malachi and who are again described very graphically in chapter 4 and verse 2. Now, it's a wonderful thing, really, that the 
Old Testament ends with the words, with a curse. Because the New Testament, Testament begins with an account of the birth of one who by his perfect obedience to God's will would eventually remove that curse. So then, brothers and sisters, let us strive in our lives to receive the true spirit of the book of Malachi, being fully persuaded that the principles set forth therein are as important to us today as are in the, as they were in those far off tragic days when this book was first put together. And these words were announced to that ecclesia of Malachi's day. We saw at the start of our studies that the word of God is living and energetic, living and active. That's how it should be in our lives. And that point was stressed in our first two studies. So the powerful and very compelling message of Malachi is actually bound up in the doctrine of God manifestation. As expressed in the divine name and as revered by those people we read of in chapter 3 verse 16. And the teaching, I suppose, as simply as you can put it, the teaching of Malachi is that if we hope to be saved, then Christ must be formed within us. The character of godliness has to be developed in us. So today, brothers and sisters, I'd like to leave you with some thoughts put together from Galatians 4 verse 19, added to some words from 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, as we'd find it in the RSV. And when you put these two passages together, I believe we have a very apt summary of everything we've discussed during the whole of our Malachi studies. And this is what we have from those verses. My little children, with whom I am again in travail until Christ be formed in you, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. And it answers also for us the question, who may abide or endure the day of his coming? Well, it's those who fear Yahweh and who think upon his name. So as we take the bread and wine, brothers and sisters, this day, we've had much to ponder from the, from the revelation of God by the hand of Malachi as we, re as we remember our Lord and Master and his sacrifice and we examine ourselves and we ask ourselves the question, who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth?